I went with the Aorus 390 Ultra to cover my needs of heavy video editing and gaming. I wanted the extra M2 slot so that I wouldn't have to split the data rate between the SATA ports or the PCI cards, as well as upgrade proof if I choose to switch over to liquid cooling for overclocking. There's a lot of these protective stickers, double check, it's easy to miss a few of them. For air cooling, the Cooler Master 212 is the easiest type of heat sink to deal with, with options to mount two fans, have the fan either on the back or front, and makes it very easy to clean or change out the fan if it fails on you. It also gives you room to install cables around the CPU slot by just removing the fans. It's a universal bracket so it supports both AMD and Intel. If you're new to installing heat sinks, follow the instructions to the letter. Some things can get confusing. Make sure all the screws are set to your CPU bracket type. And take your time when setting up the crossbar. There's a lock pin where the bracket has to rest inside so that the heat sink won't twist around. It only goes one way. The heatsink and CPU have their protective covers. You don't have to worry about it getting dirty. Test fit each component till you match how the instructions have it set up. You're dealing with thermal paste. Once you put it down, you don't want to take the heatsink off. Installing CPUs is very simple. They're keyed so they can go in one way. Just make sure not to touch the top of the CPU. You don't want your oils to interfere with the paste. The difference with the 99KF chip from the regular 99K is you need a dedicated GPU. The CPU can't output video. It saves you money, but it's not helpful if you were installing it in a server, for example. There's so many ways to put on thermal paste. They all work. I go the Akabuku way with the dot in the middle. This part of the installation is tricky. These springs fight you, so keep a firm grip on the heatsink. You don't want it thrown off. It's best to follow the order of the screws in the instructions so only the first two screws push back. Once those get tight, the last two are easy. M2 cards are basically a different form factor of a SATA drive. They install directly onto the motherboard. You can use any of the three slots. They all support the different lengths. But for my motherboard, using the bottom slot takes the data line from the last PCI port, keeping the GPU and six SATA ports on the front at full speed. Check your motherboard manual for this information. The Pro and Ultra boards support up to 64 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM. For my uses in the past, I would easily max out my older PC's 24 gigabytes of RAM when rendering videos or when hosting game servers. Double check your board's max RAM and frequency when picking. Not all RAM is supported. On this board, you need to enable the XMP mode in the UEFI 
to get the correct timings and run them at max speed. Also, disable fast boot in the Windows 10 OS power options. This causes a odd startup behavior for this board affecting the XMP profile and wake up LAN feature. You'll see this as a postcode 04 instead of the normal A0. This board has fan headers for liquid cooling and fan cooling. It's easy to plug the fans into the wrong ones, especially the CPU fan. They're right next to each other. Double check. If you notice in the video, I plug it into the wrong one at first. I went for this older thermal tank case for a few reasons. It's much lighter than Cooler Master cases. You could pick it up fully loaded. It has a modular design so everything can be removed. The fans mount outside the case, allowing me to clean the main ones without needing to open the case up, plus giving more room for wires to go. Vertical GPU mount, and it's one of the few cases that still has five and a quarter bays. I use disc media for playing older games and movies. With Aura's motherboards, the I.O. plate is built onto it so you don't have to do anything, just slide in and mount the board. This case came with all four fans and ATX standoffs pre-installed. It's better to leave the rear fan off when dealing with the power supply wires, but with the 212, you can take that one off instead. There's another protective sticker, or she put too many. Routing case wires is an art on its own. You want the wires to be packed and tied down to give the case as much airflow as it can. Plus, keeping wires away from fans, and you want it to look nice if you have a window on it. So I put all the front panel connections in the lowest cutout, with exception to the fan lighting Molex connector. Right now this 850 watt PSU is more than enough to power my system. I got a higher one for when I add in future hard drives and water cooling. I also got it for full modular design and redesigned wires, making them black and flat. It's easier to hide and not stand out from the case. Thermaltake even increased the length of their cables, so routing behind the motherboard got easier for CPU and GPU power. Plus they added in daisy chain cables, needing only one each for the CPU and GPU plugs. The back is a little bit more tricky to deal with. It also allows two hard drives to be mounted on this side, so I had to keep a space free on the top part of the drive bay.
I didn't have any Molex to SATA adapter, so I was forced to use an entire Molex cable for the fan power, but I will be using this cable to power the hard drives too. I'm mainly using the vertical video card bracket because it's something different, but it also gives a benefit for giving it better airflow instead of being in the corner of a wall. Plus, less weight is put on the motherboard over the years. But I will say, Thermaltank made a crappy design with this cable. The safety lock on the cable is too tight, so you'll see me break it off in a moment. Second, the cable's meant to be fed behind the bracket, but there's way too little clearance, so it's bent a lot. I didn't like it, so I fed the wire underneath, reducing the stress. They should have made the connector at a right angle. Also, the case doesn't tell you which screws to use in the manual. You use the PSU mounting screws. Since Gigabyte owns Aorus, both motherboard and graphics card can sync their LEDs together. You don't have to own an Aorus branded GPU. There's just enough length given so the cable is pulling tight and out of view in the vertical orientation. These are one of the things I've taken out of my old PC, so the LED's back tape is gone, so I got these clips, which are actually better. You can place them anywhere on the strip, allowing you to get around screws or welding points on the case. Aorus motherboards come with 5 and 12 volt headers for LEDs, so you won't need to use a Molex power plug. But make sure you plug the cables in the correct way. The arrow is the 12 volt line. You don't want to send 12 volts into the colors and blow it out. This is one of the drawbacks, having the GPU mounted up, headers are very hard to get to. Like the fans, the top five and a quarter bay mounts outside the case, giving you a clean look inside. The good thing is that Thermaltake measured the maximum distance a standard SATA cable can reach, so all the cables reach the drive with no problem.
I still don't understand why companies make these SATA power plugs up and not behind. This causes annoying space issues. Right now, I'm only installing two hard drives. 2.5 drives are mounted to the left side screws of the dock. You need to remove that side's quick clip. Standard three and a half hard drives are held in by the quick clips. The back side of the drive bay doesn't allow the right angle SATA cables, only standard ones fit between the spaces. When powering up the PC for the first time, it's best to only connect the bare minimum of components. So if a problem occurs, you don't have to rule out unimportant stuff. Just motherboard, PSU, CPU, RAM, and GPU are needed. For the sake of the video, I edited everything in chronological order, but I only had the bare minimum connected during the actual first boot. Motherboards act different when doing a first time boot. My older machine would boot up and do the auto detect hardware. This motherboard would boot up four times as it detects each of the components. So don't get worried if your board does this. Each board has error lights and postcodes that warn you if something is wrong. After a successful boot, make sure the auto detect feature worked correctly. In my case, certain things were not set up correctly. My board enabled turbo mode where I wanted it off so the CPU stays at its stock speed and the RAM was not displaying its maximum speed till enabled the XMP profiles. The rest is just to check basic things like voltage rail, see if the PSU is giving out stable 3.3, 5, and 12 volts, along with the CPU temp. On average, your CPU should be around 28 to 35C in the UEFI menu. If it's displaying like 50C, your thermal paste is not working correctly. Once you're happy with your setup, it's best to move on to a stress test, making sure you don't have faulty RAM or CPU. Mem test takes usually 12 to 15 hours to do a full test. It's best to do it overnight. If everything passes, the PC is ready for your operating system of choice. Thanks for watching.